episode two of the Diedrich Taylor Coaches Show is back. Brandon Marcus here, the voice you do want to hear more so than mine. Once again, is that of Cal State Fullers and head coach Diedrich Taylor. Diedrich, what's up? Not much, man. Just trying to make it. Yeah, you know what? Hey, you're making it. You're doing it. And you have a season opener in one week. We're recording this one on Wednesday, November 18th. Can you believe it's here after all of what you've gone through? Can you believe it's here? I can't. Um, You know, I literally are trying to take one day at a time because every day is going to be different. Um, We learned some new information in regards to COVID today. We learned some new information in regards to our team today. And so every day we're learning more information and learning new stuff and how to adapt to that has become um, what's most important. You know, it's not the adversity, it's how you respond. And, and so we're trying to respond the right way. And we're still still learning that, you know, and when I say we, I'm more so talking about me learning that how to respond and then in turn teaching our team how to respond. But, you know, th- th- this it's hard to believe that we're, we're actually even doing this, let alone the timing. Um, things have gone super, super fast. So we're in a situation where a week from today, we'll, we'll tip it up and, and we'll, we'll roll the balls out there and see, you know, who represents the Titans that, that night and, and hope like heck we win. In the first episode, we discussed COVID and how that impacted the season last year and how it impacted recruiting and the off season. And we've said all along, the purpose of this podcast is going to be to inform and to give everybody an idea of what's going to happen with COVID and how the team is going to handle that. And we're going to talk about a couple different topics. We're going to get into the schedule. We're going to get into the roster. We're going to get into your guys' mantra this season, which is embrace the suck. But quickly, you just mentioned that you learned some more stuff about COVID. What did you learn that you're able to share about what's going to be going on? Because everyone's wondering, how is the team able to play? How is the team able to play against another team? because everybody obviously has their own bubble. And now these bubbles again are going to converge. Yeah. Um, Those two questions. I don't know that anyone can answer those two questions. Like how are we able to play and how are we able to play another team? Because quite frankly, I don't know who's going to be out there. Um, You know, obviously in the summer you have your recruiting, you have a depth chart, but that depth chart today looks totally different than we thought it would be, you know, heading into our first season. Um, so we're, we're scrambling, trying to make uh, chicken salad out of chick or chicken, chicken salad. Literally, we're scrambling, trying to make it up. You know, we're pulling different uh, things out of our cupboard. And so we're trying to do that. Um, but it's hard to believe, you know, obviously, we're, we, you know, we were, we we're right up against it. We're going to play. And, and it is what it is. You know, what, what I've learned today, um, this morning, I was on a call that, that featured Dan Gavitt. And it also featured Dr. Hainline, who is responsible for disseminating the medical information regarding COVID to the whole entire NCAA. It's not just men's basketball, it's the whole deal. And so we were on a call today, and I think layman's terms and making it short and sweet is that is this, we're going to play NCAA basketball no matter what. I was under the assumption that eventually we probably will get shut down by our own county, our own state, and so on and so forth. And the NCAA's take is that that's probably going to happen. They've already assumed that that will happen. And so I wouldn't say that they necessarily don't care because they do, but the end result is what they care most about, and that is producing a champion. That is producing a Final Four. That is producing a bubble that will encompass all 68 teams in one spot playing to get to the final four to get to uh the championship and so that is completely different than 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 what i thought in my mindset um you know one way or the other we're we're going to play whether fullerton is a part of that or not it doesn't matter you know whether michigan is a part of that or not it really doesn't matter the assumption is that they are going to miss time they're going to have to serve their quarantine or they're going to have to serve an isolation period. But during that, while each team is serving that, there are other teams that are going to play. And those teams playing, they're going to somehow lead to 68 teams playing in a tournament format, hopefully, uh, eventually uh, leading to a championship. And that's that's different than what I thought. And I think that's what's what we can expect as a public. That's what we can expect. 
if you trip on the rock, no one's going to come get you, basically. Is that you, you keep on going and you got to catch up. And whether that means you getting shut down for two weeks because of COVID, or that means that you have something that can't be contained yep. and that your season is going to end prematurely. The, the beat goes on, uh, shall they, is what they say. And so yeah. that's exactly what you're trying to say, is that it, it will continue. And we've said this, I think we said this in the first episode, but – the Big West, the rule is if you have a positive case, just one, right? That means the whole team has to then quarantine and forfeit the next two weeks. Is that what it is? I th- yeah. Right now, it's <clears throat> right now, it's it's there's a difference between isolation and quarantine. Isolation okay. is only 10 days, and that who is who tests positive. And okay. then quarantine is for those that are exposed to the positive test, but don't test positive, they test negative. So my understanding is that if one player gets it, and I'm not speaking in regards to the Big West because I don't know that the Big West necessarily has a blanket approach. I think they've left it up to each school. Our school is going to basically shut us down. If one player, one coach, one manager, anybody gets it, they're gonna shut us down for conceivably 14 days, but it's probably longer or it could be longer. And this is also something that I learned today from Dr. Hainline that they used to, um, used to being when this first started, they, you know, we were bringing athletes back off of COVID, people that have tested positive. They recommended that you get a test from an EKG to read their heart. And, you know, there's a medical term, I think it's mighty, mighty cardiologist i'm saying it way no you're you're i know exactly what you're talking about it's the one that the big 10 was worried about and that's what they wanted they wanted to have the heart exam and so what they have learned through information and they have created an algorithm where they are no longer recommending that test in fact they're saying don't do that here's what you do you should isolate for 10 days and the other thing that i learned that is possible and i don't know if i'm supposed to say this but it's possible that that period of isolation could be cut down to three to five days if the person that tested positive if they produce a negative test well that makes sense that is some isolation so so yeah. the, the, the 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 timing of everything i think will be or they're hoping that things will be sped up a little bit you know to get us back on the floor uh, if we are unfortunately testing positive and that makes sense because there could be a, a false positive. So that's one thing that's, I mean, there's going to be a false positive at some point this season, there's going to be a false positive. Um, and you just have to kind of work around that. And what's interesting with this is this sport and everybody's watching other sports, for example, football is going on right now. Yep. And you're seeing that someone's being placed in the COVID list, whether that means they've had exposure or they have COVID themselves. And you're wondering to yourself, well, why are more players in that team not getting COVID? Because there are a couple of examples, Tennessee, uh, Las Vegas, where numerous players got it. But there have been isolated incidents where it's only been one to two to three players. The, the difference is that this sport of basketball, you're on top of each other for a longer period of time. No you're in the same location for a longer period of time, and you're indoors. Yeah. So all those things combined, you have to assume that – if there is a positive test, more likely than not, there's going to be several more positive tests that come with it. Yeah, no question. And I learned this today that that is important to differentiate between um, indoor and outdoor because it pertains to the ventilation. Outdoor, we know ventilation is plenty. There's, you know, you know everything's ventilated. Indoor, it's not the same. And so outdoors, guys, they can go back and look at the film and say, you know, and isolate a player and whoever was in contact with them and, you know, not shut the whole team down. Whereas basketball is not as well ventilated. It's indoors. And like you mentioned, we're rubbing up against each other. We're we're in close contact with each other. So even if they go back and watch the film, the film probably does nothing but confirm the fact that, hey, he touched everybody on the whole team. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're, we're, we're under that, that, that differentiation between the ventilation is, is very, very important. And something I thought that I learned today also from Dr. Hainline was early, we were talking about touching the basketball, you know, sharing basketballs Yeah, is no longer an issue um, based on the evidence and based on the information that Dr. Hainline has been privy to. 
that is not an issue. We can share balls and the, and the virus doesn't stay on those services and it is not spread that way. It's spread through contact or proximity within six feet of each other for longer than 15 minutes, then there's more likely of you, more likely chance that you have the, have the virus. Yeah, or I mean, if, if your point guard's bringing it up and he's being guarded by somebody at the top of the perimeter and he's screaming out the play, the no screaming, doubt. what you mean, you never know what, what could happen there with the aerosol and yeah. then it gets dicey and you got people running back and forth inside that aerosol and yeah. so it gets dicey. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see I'm glad you're able to bring that insight because that's a, a lot of knowledge that people don't have in terms of what's going to happen and the ability for the NCAA to continue. And we've just, we've figured out, I think it was yesterday they announced the whole bubble thing about it yeah. going to Indianapolis yeah. and they're them trying to figure out a way to do it there. And it made sense. I mean, I, I thought all along there'd probably be three or four cities, Los Angeles, Indianapolis, but in the end, it's actually only one. It's going to yeah. be one place. They're going to send everybody there. And it's big enough where you can have people in different hotels. You can take over a whole hotel, teams yeah. in different floors, and be able to figure it out. Definitely. I think the NCAA used um, the tennis organization. I think it was the professional tennis organization. They just finished their tournament. And they had the first, they, they are the first uh, sporting event, so it must be college-related. Um, There's sport first tournament format sporting event uh, in New York. And so they were kind of able to gain information and insight as to how to do certain things and what not to do, what to do. And in some instances came up that they were able to vet those. And so again, it provides them more and more information. It's unfortunate that we're, you know, people are catching the virus because we're coming together and so on and so forth, but they're able to take that information and figure out how can we keep this person safe? And then how can we keep the general population safe? So it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. And I think the best thing that we can do in a general public as a general public is, is learn how to pivot because there is change coming every day almost. And, and the quicker we learn how and embrace pivoting, the better off I think we'll be as far as our mindset is concerned. You mentioned embrace pivoting. Well, you're also going to be embracing the suck this season. Yeah. That is the team motto. Um, we're going to discuss that more in detail in terms of how it's going to apply to the team. But there is something that we definitely want to get into. And that is something that was brought up. I believe it was it was a couple months after the season ended um, where we saw the Cal State Fullerton Twitter account tweet out um, that some that you had personal stuff going on and that basically the Taylor family re requested privacy at this time. And so I'm sure there are people that know what's going on, but I'm sure there's a lot of Titans fans that don't know what happened. So do you want to give everyone a look in behind the curtain into what went on um, during the off season? Yeah, I'll be happy to. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to all those people that, 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 that prayed for me um, and, and wondered out loud what was going on. But instead of trying to figure it out, they just said, Hey, send it up a positive word and a positive thought towards my way. And, and uh, I needed all of it. Um, quite frankly, I, I definitely needed all of it, but to, to, to bring you behind the scenes, so to speak, I was experiencing some pretty severe headaches uh, since last year, November, um, at the start of the season. And first we thought, you know, it was probably sinus related. We thought maybe um, it was a cold or a flu, but I was experiencing some pretty severe headaches um, since again, since November. And, you know, I would take certain things or do certain things. I was seeing the team doctor, and but these headaches continued to uh, persist as the season went on. And I think as the season even went on, they, they got, you know, even worse. Um, so, so obviously the COVID hit and it shut us all down. And so I took that opportunity to learn about myself. I took that opportunity to seek out help. Hey, how can I get rid of these headaches? Because they were intensifying as time went on. Um, so long story short, I was able to get a hold of our of a personal, not a personal, but the physician, and and he directed me, kind of listened to my story over Zoom and listened to the, some of the effects and said, "Hey, I think you have a stress headache um, because it, the the pain and the headaches would start um, at the base of my neck and they would shoot up, um, and they would be all over the place. They'd be on the right, they'd be on the left, they'd be in the middle, they'd be all over the place. But they would they would hurt um, really really bad. And so during the season." it became a part of, of me. Like I would wake up and say, I have a headache, cool. My head hurts and I go on my day. Or I would not have a headache and I would say, dang, there's a headache coming. 
when it hits, I'll be ready for it. And I go on by my day, regardless of the fact I probably had a headache at some point or most of the day. And so I wasn't sleeping. I was doing all kinds of things, trying to trying to get a couple of hours of sleep here and there. And so, um, like I said, I, I saw the physician and he thought it was a stress related headache because of what I do. It's a high stress business. So he recommended Botox um, from the pain management doctor. Um, Botox is the same effect, has the same effect as as uh muscle relaxers, but it doesn't have the negative impact in terms of making me sleepy and those things. So he suggested that. And so I went to the pain management doctor and he's, I'm thinking I'm going to get Botox and move on. He said, you know, he listened to my story and said, Hey, let's just MRI it just, just to be safe. It sounds cool. It sounds safe, but let's just be safe. So we MRI it. And a week later he calls me and basically says, coach, we found uh, a mass on your brain. And, um, you know, it, it, most people, it kind of debilitates you it kind of like, what? Like, you're like, and, and the whole time he's telling me, you know, that we found this mass on your brain. It's about 3.5 centimeters wide, um, where it's located. It's right behind on your right side. And, you know, it can cause this if it's on the inside and if it could cause that on the outside, but somewhere, somehow I had this other voice telling me, and I know who it was, but I had this other voice basically calming me down and saying, don't worry about nothing. Everything will be just fine. And so I hung out with the doctor and I went to former boys and got a breakfast burrito. That's how calm I was. Uh, but I came home and this is a Monday morning. I came home and I sat around and, you know, the doctor told me that the neurosurgeon would be in touch to consult with me and so on and so forth. And so this number kept showing up on my phone, calling me. And so finally I said, Hey man, you know, hello, who is this? And so they, they asked, could they speak with me and so on and so forth. And they said, can you get to ER right away? And at the time it was like 1250. And I remember looking at the clock, it was 1250. And I got a little nervous. I got a little scared at that moment because of how quickly they responded, but how quickly they wanted me to respond. And checking into the ER, that would tell you something's, something's not right. And so I said, sure, I'll, you know, I can, I can be at the ER, but, but I'm still in my mind, <laughs> in my mind, all I can think about is the next morning, I have a tea time at 6 a.m. <laughs> and a new course that I could, that I was going to play. And I had just shot an 86. So like I was, I, there's nothing you could say to bother me. So that's what I was thinking. So I go to the ER and they're telling me, Hey, call us when you get there, we're going to bring, we're going to come over the neurosurgeon to come over. So I call and sure enough, he comes over and he shows me the MRI and he shows me the mass on my brain. And you know, he's checking my balance, he's checking my strength and all of these different things. And, and I'm saying, hey doc, I just shot an 86. Like there's nothing wrong with me other than I have a headache. I have a headache. Like if you ask me to bend over and pick that up, something off the ground, I can do it, but it'll, it'll hurt really, really bad. My head, it'll start, you know. So long story short, all I could care about, what I think about was I got to get this MRI that afternoon and 6 a.m. will be here. I got to move on go play for my tea, my tea time. Well, long story short, I get checked into the hospital that night. Um, and they do the MRI that night. I checked in the St. Joe's hospital and they were great. They were awesome. Um, the next morning, the next day I have an angiogram. The next day, which is Wednesday, I have another angiogram to see it and to clamp it off. And then Thursday, I had the mass removed. And so the mass is determined to be a tumor. It's a benign tumor. It's not cancerous. They sent it off and none, none of the above, but it, nonetheless, it was there. So I have a relatively long scar on the back of my head from, from you know them taking the tumor out and testing it, obviously. And so I went back and, and uh, to my room and Walked around on Friday, walked around on Saturday, so much so that they were releasing me on Sunday. And I was a little groggy probably for the first couple of weeks. Um, um, but I mean, I, my head's in a wrap. I got 26, I think 26 staples. And so I'm not supposed to do anything. And, and I'm taking medicine because I don't want to hear anybody say anything. Don't tell them I said that, but I don't want to hear anything. Nothing. And, so, and you're not golfing. Yeah, I'm not doing anything. I'm laying <laughs> on the couch and, and, you know, I'm walking around. The funny thing is, uh, one of my best friends sent me a five wood, he sent me a five wood, like in this big box. And I would literally have stitches in my head, 
with the bandages all around, but I would swing that club in my house as I would, that was my exercise, swinging that club, swinging that club. And so um, eventually uh, we were able to make a full recovery. Um, but I will say this, the doctor refers to me as his miracle patient. And he refers to me as that because four to six weeks in, I was driving myself to the appointments. Normally he prescribes rehab at that time to learn how to walk, to learn how to talk, people are trying to figure things out. And so where this tumor was located and what it was doing was pushing on my cerebral cortex. And that controls all of your strength. It controls all of your balance. It controls everything. And so basically the doctor said, if I would have lost that, it would have been hell to pay if I would have gotten it back. And so the fact that I've gotten all my faculties about me, I'm still crazy. I still talk crazy and do stupid stuff. Um, I'm fully recovered and I am back to my normal self. Um, but I will say this, laying in the hospital bed by myself because under the COVID circumstances, nobody could be in the hospital except the workers. And so I was laying there by myself and I don't know, it was about three in the morning. I'm wide awake. And I said this, I asked myself, I said, how do you think or what are you going to do in terms of how you are going to respond to all of the things that people are seeing and saying, whether it's your health, whether it's social injustice, whether it's responding with the co to the COVID. At that point, I made the decision that I was gonna respond in two ways. And those two ways reflected love because there's so much hate in no matter what you do, somebody hates it. Mm -hmm. But I choose love. And I chose to be productive within whatever space I was going to be in. I made a choice at that moment at three in the morning to, 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 to enact those two concepts. And that has changed about me. That has changed about my mindset. I'm coming from a place of love. I'm coming from a place of producing. Doesn't always do that. Doesn't always come across that way. But that's my mindset. And, and you know, I thank God more than, than, than people would recognize for putting me in that situation and sending me through that issue to come out on the other side to say that I'm going to respond out of love and I'm going to be productive, as productive as I possibly can. And so a lot of people don't know, especially if you talk to me, like looking at me right now, you never know that, that, that I had an issue. I told a guy that I had that surgery last night and he was like, what? You did what? When? So June 11th was my surgery date, and I'll never, ever, ever forget it. And so I'm grateful um, in, 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 in a lot of ways, a lot of ways. It's an incredible story of someone that was getting beaten down, <laughs> and you continue to take it. Yeah. And then finally, it's you and I talked about this when you first told me, and it, it the coronavirus has had so many negative aspects of it i mean it's affected so many people in so many different negative ways but in in this regard it may have helped save your life in a way because you were able to finally start taking care of yourself and everybody talks about how the one benefit of being at home during all this is you're able to kind of take care of yourself and be with family and how important those things are but in this aspect you, you, you never really took care of yourself first. It was more about you have the team and it's always the team aspect and you're making sure the players are, they're ready for the next game. And in this case, you were able to finally be like, okay, I'm going to take care of my health issue. And you did. And so as negative as, and as awful as the last several months have been in a way, weirdly enough, it helped you. Yeah, no, it, it is, it is weird to say the least. Um, because I don't know that I would have taken the time to actually reach out to a doctor and then follow through regarding me. Now, if it was one of our players or if it was somebody else, yeah, I would have did it with a, in a heartbeat. But I don't know that I would have necessarily done it for me. But because we were under the COVID circumstances, it gave me the necessary time to look out for me and to take care of me. And I will tell that to anybody, any coach in particular, like it is necessary. It is important that you take care of you because here's the thing, if you're not right, if you don't 
treat yourself right, you can't expect or tell your players to because they're going to end up and inevitably they're going to follow the head. The snake, the rest of the snake's body is going to go wherever the head goes and it's going to treat itself however the head tells it to treat itself. And so it's important for me to now go through the situation that I went through, but for people to understand, hey man, that work, those responsibilities ain't going nowhere. It'll be there the next day or the next day and the next day. Take care of you. That is uber important. So tell me about the team motto and what that's going to encompass. Um, you know, the, the motto is embrace the suck. Um, because I think every which direction you turn, you are seeing really bad circumstances. And so how I came about it was I was playing golf with a, uh, a military guy, um, a high ranking official. And he just said it kind of, it's their motto. Because if you think about the military, their circumstances always suck, but they have to be productive because if they're not productive, they could lose their life. And if they lose their life, we in turn lose our freedom and our life. So they take it to another level. And so he just said it in passing. And honestly, it hit me like a ton of bricks. All that we're seeing, all that we're going through, the tournament being canceled, that sucked. Um, you know, not having summer school, that sucked. Not being able to go to work, that sucks. But all we see is just this, this really, really bad outlook. Well, we have to learn how to embrace it and be productive. No matter, and despite all of that we see, we still need to be productive. We still need to find a way to exist. And embracing the suck is going to be that for us because no matter how you look at a situation, there is some suck in it no matter what and if you embrace it and acknowledge it and say it definitely sucks but i'm going to be productive in spite of that is our motto that is what we are charged with that is what we're responsible for and we're going to indoctrinate that uh to our team and introduce it to our team and it is going to be who we are we're embracing the fact that we're playing a game on november 25th and yes we started practice four weeks ago three weeks ago that's without summer that's lifting and that's practicing. We started three weeks ago and then three weeks later, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna play. That inevitably sucks, but you can say it sucks or you can embrace that it sucks and still make a good positive outcome of the situation. And that's what we're determined to do is make a positive impact and a positive uh, outcome uh, of the situation. Yeah, you, you can sit at home and say, what was me and sulk or you can make the best of the situation that's exactly what you guys are going to do is make the best of it uh, before we get to our final part and we don't have a whole lot of time because i think we're gonna try and limit this these uh shows slash podcast episodes to about 30 minutes yeah um and this this was an important one that i wanted to get to before the season started first off if you want to email the show d taylor coaches show at gmail.com d taylor coaches show at gmail.com and that's coaches with an es um hit us up with your questions we're gonna have a mailbag episode um actually we're gonna do a mailbag part of the episode every single episode yeah. so hit us up with questions um questions you have for coach about the season about any certain players um anything and, and we'll, i'll answer yeah and we'll we'll hit on it so feel free reach out we'd love to hear from you um let us know also where you're listening from and where you're watching from i want to get into the roster but i don't want to do it today just because i want to sure. go player by player yeah. Um, and I think we'll try to do an episode before the season opener. Sure. So we can kind of discuss the roster. Uh, yeah. We'll see if we're able to make that work. If not, then we'll touch on it in when we do the recap of the first game. We'll touch on the roster. Um, but I do want to hit on the schedule because yeah. it's interesting. You're playing three games in November, November 25th, 27th, 28th. You're playing in San Diego, Portland, and Washington. And those are all in Washington at the Husky Classic. Then you have a month off, basically. And you play against CSUN twice, if I'm correct. And, yeah. and then you get into conference play. So really, it's three games and then nothing for a month. <laughs> and then you have the two warm-up games before conference. So what's the goal um, of these three games? Because wins and losses obviously are important wins are nice it helps your resume and the ncaa tournament and your rpi whether you're going to be a 15 seed or a 14 seed um but realistically what's the 
what would you like to see from these guys in these three games next week? You know, I think, I think realistically, um, I just want to see them get better. Uh, I want to see them um, attempt to do things that are over out outside of their comfort zone, um, which is play hard and, and try to share the basketball. Um, conceptually, we have some things in that we would like to do. We still defended, we still rebounded, and we still are going to run. That's our model. That's what we believe in. That's what we've taught to. Um, I don't know how well that will look, but um, at the end of the day, I'm going to manage our expectations and, and embrace the fact that we probably are not going to be a finished product. Um, we're far from it. And so we're going to use these three games in a tournament format to try to get better at certain things on the floor and then obviously try to win every game that we play. But we just want to get better. Um, and and that's, that's, that's up to us. That's up to the staff to evaluate how we got better um, and, and then what we got better at, but then also set the, set the criteria for the next game. And so that's basically the first three games. There are some other games scheduled. Um, I think we have the University of Portland scheduled. I think we have another game at the University of San Diego. I think we have Pacific coming to us, but we're not necessarily publicizing and making it public because it could change any given yeah. day. Like, like right now, I don't know that the game will happen with the University of Portland because of the numbers. Um, our administrations are talking and there's a good chance that that may or may not take place. You know, so I don't know that that it's been released or all of our schedule. I think we're focused on these three games because right now, sitting here on Wednesday, November 18th, November 25th is going to happen. We think um, we're not sure about what will happen after that. And then obviously this, the conference released the, the, the Big West schedule um, playing December 28th and 29th against CSUN. Let me ask you something that hopefully we can answer quickly. When are you going up to Seattle? Because I'm sure there's going to be um, something you want to do in terms of testing these players before the games actually start. So we fly on Monday, uh, November 23rd. But in between that, so what we've gone to, we used to test once a week, um, but now we've gone to this week where we're testing three times a week. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we'll test. Then we'll test again right before we get on the plane. And then we'll test again right I think we test again once we get to Seattle mm -hmm. and kind of create the bubble format. All four teams are staying at the same hotel. We're eating the same food. We're doing the same. So kind of creating a little bit of a bubble. But within that bubble, they'll also be testing um, taking place. Uh, I think it's so many hours before you tip. You have to have a test, a negative test produced. Um, so we'll be up there probably almost a week. So we'll probably, we'll, we'll, we'll not probably, we will test three times while we're up there. And I'm assuming the goal is to play everyone because I'm, I'm guessing that fitness levels is not where you want it to be at this yeah. point. I think I conditioning, I think, I think you'll, you'll definitely see everybody that's healthy. Um, conditioning um, leads to injury, knock on wood, but we're hoping, you know, obviously we need to use everybody for that simple fact. We want to, you know, stay healthy and that's a goal. That's how we're going to get better is, is are we starting the game healthy and are we finishing with the same, bodies being healthy that's a goal for us is, is to be healthy and, and conditioning is one of those uh issues and and probably you know one of the biggest factors in that 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 piece well if you're watching this show on youtube we appreciate you doing that if you are listening to this as a podcast format where you can really listen to this wherever you get your podcast give us a five-star rating review the podcast as well it does help to uh get this thing out there and grow because coach is doing something that not many coaches right now in the country are doing, and that's giving you guys behind the scenes access into what is going on and what is going to be a very strange season where games will get canceled. Teams will get COVID and it's going to be fascinating to see how everyone deals with it and what the protocols are and coaches trying to give you that inside look that not many others are giving you. So coach Wednesday, the 18th, Yes, Wednesday the 25th is when you tip off. We're only a week away. Uh, it's crazy to think that that is the case. One week away from basketball, but we're ready to go and yep. appreciate you as always. Hey, appreciate you guys and appreciate you and taking the time to listen and, and you for interviewing and for putting the information out there. And we're going to try to give the people everything that they can stand. And a lot of it will come from their questions, but more so from you as well. And we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks.